Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as mastoiditis. So mastoiditis is a condition involving inflammation of the mastoid air cells of the temporal bone. So the mastoid air cells are going to be located in what we call the mastoid process. The mastoid process is the bony protuberance behind the ear. So this is where we actually get the name mastoiditis. Itis means inflammation and mastoid refers to the mastoid process. So not only is this due to inflammation, but it is actually due to infection of the mastoid air cells of the temporal bone. Now this infection can be often due to a complication involving acute otitis media, which is a middle ear infection. So a middle ear infection in some cases can spread into the mastoid air cells leading to inflammation and infection of those air cells leading to this condition, what we would call mastoiditis. So this condition more commonly affects children. And the reason it does this is because there is an increased prevalence of acute otitis media in children. So because of that increased prevalence of a middle ear infection in children, they're more likely to have this complication occur. So in fact, because so many cases of middle ear infection can occur in young children, most cases of mastoiditis will occur in children less than two years of age. So some of the risk factors that increase the likelihood of having mastoiditis not only include young age, but also include being immunocompromised. So if there are little children who have a poor or suppressed immune system for some reason, they're more likely to have mastoiditis. And then if they're more prone to having recurrent acute otitis media episodes, they're more likely to also have mastoiditis as well, because one of those episodes of acute otitis media may lead to mastoiditis. So all of these are going to be risk factors for mastoiditis. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of mastoiditis. As mentioned before, mastoiditis is a complication of acute otitis media. So if we were to actually take a brief look at ear anatomy, we have the outer ear, which consists of the ear pinna, the external auditory canal leading to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. This would be considered the outer ear. Past the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, we have the middle ear, which includes the middle ear bones, like the malleus incus and stapes. And then as we move further in, we have the stapes that are attached to what we call the oval window. And this transduces sound waves into the cochlea. And we also have these semicircular canals for balance. So these would all be structures of the inner ear. So in acute otitis media, the middle ear is going to be affected. So it's going to be this area here. So because mastoiditis is a complication of acute otitis media, we need to know how acute otitis media occurs in the first place. And often it's going to be due to a bacterial infection. Now there are three main bacterial species that cause acute otitis media. One of them is going to be Streptococcus pneumoniae. The other one is going to be Haemophilus influenzae. And the other one is going to be Moraxella catarralis. These are going to be three common bacteria that cause acute otitis media. Now there are some other organisms that can lead to acute otitis media as well, including Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pyogenes, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is going to be an important cause as well. So we need to know this because it's going to help us understand some of the treatment modalities later on in this lesson. So what can happen here is that there can be inflammation in the middle ear and surrounding areas due to one of these bacteria or multiple bacterial species. Now, if we were to actually look at where the mastoid process is, the mastoid process is this bony protuberance behind the ear. And if we were to actually look inside that mastoid process, we see what we call these mastoid air cells or mastoid cells of Lenoir. So these mastoid air cells are going to be what are affected in this condition. And the reason is because the middle ear epithelium is continuous with the mastoid air cells. If there's inflammation and infection in the middle ear, in some cases, it can lead to a continuous spread of the infection and inflammation into the mastoid air cells. And when this happens, then we have mastoiditis. So again, when that infection and inflammation spreads from the middle ear into the mastoid air cells, we have mastoiditis. And mastoiditis can be described in five stages of pathophysiology. The first stage of mastoiditis can be what we would call hyperemia of the mastoid cell mucosa. So there is inflammation and more blood flow into the area of the mastoid air cells. We can then go into the next stage of pathophysiology where we would see transudation and exudation. So there'd be fluid or pus that starts to accumulate in the mastoid air cells. If the mastoiditis becomes worse, 
we can see bone necrosis. These little bony air cells can start to become necrotic. And then there can be, in some cases, cell wall loss. So the little walls that make up these air cells can start to become lost and can actually coalesce into larger pockets. And then furthermore, in some cases, there may be even further contiguous spread of the infection and inflammation into other areas of the central nervous system. This is where we may see some issues with meningitis, for instance. So in some very severe cases of mastoiditis, we can see bone necrosis, so death of bone. We can see this hollowing out of these mastoid air cells, so cell wall loss. And then we can even see, in some cases, continuous spread of the infection inflammation into other parts of the head, which can ultimately lead to meningitis in some cases. Let's talk about the clinical features of mastoiditis. So it's important to make note of the fact that because this is a complication of acute otitis media, we're going to see signs and symptoms of acute otitis media, which include fever, ear pain. There may have been signs and symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection. If it's a child, they may pull down on their ear, on the ear flap. That may actually help with some pain. So these can be some of the signs and symptoms of acute otitis media. With regards to mastoiditis, in addition to those signs and symptoms, there are common findings of mastoiditis, including tenderness and pain to palpation over the mastoid process. So if you were to look behind the ear of the patient, it can be reddened and can be swollen in some cases, and it can be very tender and painful to touch. So this is often going to be a hallmark finding of mastoiditis. So as I mentioned before, the mastoid area or the area over the mastoid process can become erythematous, so it can become reddened in appearance. Another common finding of mastoiditis can be otorrhea. So otorrhea is a drainage from the ears. This can be something that can be noted as well. And it's going to be most particularly important in the case where it's been chronic otorrhea that has lasted at least three weeks in duration. So this can be a sign that there may be some more severe underlying condition that's occurring. And then another important finding is going to be retroauricular swelling. So this would be swelling in behind the ear with proptosis of the ear. If the swelling is so much, it actually may push the ear forward. So there may be some disruption or malpositioning of the ear because of the swelling. And then another finding may be fever. And oftentimes, if there is a fever, it can be high and may be of a sudden onset. In mastoiditis, the ear pain can be described as deep or behind the ear. And for whatever reason, it often will be more painful at night. And with regards to mastoid process tenderness and redness, this may be a sign of what we would call acute surgical mastoiditis. Now, there are some other signs and symptoms that can occur in mastoiditis, including hearing loss, a rupture of the tympanic membrane. If there's so much fluid in behind the tympanic membrane, it may actually cause a rupturing of the membrane, and that may lead to some of that fluid or drainage from the ear. Fistula formation may also occur if there's so much inflammation in the area of the mastoid process, a little hole, a little fistula may form and there may be some oozing even behind the ear. So there may be a little hole in the bone in behind the ear at the location of the mastoid process that forms due to chronic and severe inflammation in that area. Neurological symptoms may occur in some very severe cases as well as mentioned in the pathophysiology of mastoiditis. In severe cases, there may be contiguous spread of the infection inflammation from the mastoid air cells into other areas of the head that may even lead to meningitis. So we may see neurological findings as well. And then because children are most commonly affected, some signs and symptoms that occur in children may include irritability and being fussy and having ear pain where they pull on the pinna of the ear or the ear flap. And again, they may pull on their ear for pain relief. So that may be a sign that they're having ear pain. So how do clinicians actually diagnose mastoiditis? Early diagnosis is going to be critical. As I mentioned before, if it is a very severe case of mastoiditis, it can lead to severe complications like meningitis. Autoscope findings may look like acute otitis media, as we mentioned before. Again, this is a complication of acute otitis media. And then sample collection. So if there's any drainage or if there's any ability to collect some sample to culture and to look for antibiotic sensitivities is going to be important as well. So the otorrhea fluid may be something that can be used. A tympanocentesis, which is going in and taking out fluid from behind the tympanic membrane. And then blood, any blood collection may be helpful as well. A CBC can be important, so a complete blood count. So looking at the white blood cell count may indicate likelihood of risk of complication. If there's a higher white blood cell count, that indicates that there may be a higher risk of complication. Audiometry is going to be important to assess for hearing loss. 
And CT imaging can be utilized as well. And we can look in this image here to see that compared to this side, we can see that the mastoid air cells are inflamed. So there is a dulling out of these mastoid air cells in this location. So the CT imaging is actually going to be the standard imaging modality for diagnosing mastoiditis. And again, often we're going to look for opacification of mastoid air cells. And CT imaging is going to be important to assess for coalescence of mastoid air cells. As we mentioned before, in severe cases, there may be cell wall necrosis and cell wall loss of these mastoid air cells where the smaller air cells start to coalesce into larger air cells. So this is going to be important to assess for with CT imaging. Once clinicians have diagnosed mastoiditis, how do they treat it? So again, we can look at treating the underlying cause of mastoiditis, that being acute otitis media. Not all cases of acute otitis media require treatment or antibiotic treatment, but some do, and this can be helpful in actually reducing the risk of having mastoiditis. In cases of uncomplicated mastoiditis, which would be cases where the signs and symptoms are mild, there are no neurological signs and symptoms, there are no fistulas, there are no signs of any coalescence of mastoid air cells, these particular cases may be treated medically. So IV antibiotics can be utilized, and these IV antibiotics are going to be dependent on species coverage, so that it's going to be determined by those culture and sensitivities we talked about in the last slide. So some antibiotics that can be used include ceftriaxone and vancomycin. Vancomycin may be used in cases where there may be suspicion of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. IV corticosteroids, antipyretics, and topical antibiotics can also be utilized as well. So in some more mild cases, topical antibiotics may be utilized and applied inside the ear. IV corticosteroids can be helpful in reducing some of the inflammation, and antipyretics can be used to help reduce some of the fever that patients may be experiencing. And then if medical therapy has not been helpful, surgical therapy may be employed, especially if there's no improvement in 48 hours or if it's a complicated case. So if there are severe symptoms, if the patient has a high fever, if they have coalescence of those mastoid air cells we talked about before, or if there are any signs or symptoms of any neurological issues, this is going to be where surgery is going to be important. This would be considered a complicated mastoiditis case. So some of the surgical methods can include meringotomy and tympanocentesis. Placing a tympanostomy tube can be helpful as well. And in some cases, a mastoidectomy, removing the affected mastoid process can be helpful. So this is going to be employed in more specific cases where there is acute superlative otitis media that is refractory to antibiotics and there is shown on CT imaging coalescence of those mastoid air cells, which would be considered coalescent mastoiditis. So if you start to see some of those very severe findings, mastoidectomy can be employed in those particular cases. Now, I also want to mention that besides treatment, preventative mechanisms can also be utilized to help reduce the risk of mastoiditis, and one of them is going to be pneumococcal vaccination. As mentioned before, streptococcus pneumoniae is going to be an important and common bacterial cause of acute otitis media. So if there's vaccination against streptococcus pneumoniae, this can help reduce the risk of acute otitis media and subsequently reduce the risk of having mastoiditis as a complication. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.